Okay, our last talk for today, Overlay Data Center Information by Christian Kneip. Kneip sorry. <laughs> uh, no problem. Yeah, uh, hello and welcome. Um, I'm pleased to, to talk on this, uh, this uh, conference and now I'm concluding kind of this session or this, uh, this track. And uh, I had very nice discussions and very interesting talks that I attended and during the breaks it was uh, quite nice. So thanks NetWays for this opportunity. And yeah, maybe we give him uh, applause. So um, me, I spawned uh, roughly 30 years ago. And I started 10 years ago as a normal sysadmin, so normal in case of a little university where I do th did the user help desk and little little things. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, they, the university was using Mac and uh, Unix or Linux, so I would get infected and I got rid of my Windows uh, history. And after the apprenticeship, I started working on behalf of Audi, not for Audi. So I worked on behalf of Audi and uh, did R&D uh, administration and support. So it was, uh, yeah, no matter what. Um, after two years of uh, this environment, I decided to, to get my bachelor degree because um, first I did bash scripting and then I decided, okay, bash scripting is maybe not uh, scaling to the extent that I used, <laughs> that I needed to, to have. So I did my bachelor degree in, in tubing and worked for on behalf of Daimler. So I'm uh, bundled to the automotive world, I guess. Um, so during this period, I maybe I merged somehow into DevOps because I, I digged into the, the problem, scripted my way around and uh, try to be open and share and learn uh, the DevOps tools, let's say. And uh, since one year, I start working at Bull. So Bull, uh, as we say in France, is uh, the mother company of science and computing. And I start as an R&D engineer last year in January and work now as an ops dev, if this word is uh, existing. So I'm coming from the ops world and now I'm working for uh, or creating supercomputer cluster management, so uh, large machines or large cluster machines, and it's quite fun, actually. So the agenda today, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the cluster stack, and um, in particular, or the, the motivation of the talk comes from my history in InfiniBand, so I did, uh, at Daimler, I, I administrated with others uh, a 3000 node cluster that um, do crash test all day and we had InfiniBand and I was in charge of that so uh, I had some pain and I will explain what pain I had. Um, as a response I created uh, uh, InfiniBand monitoring framework uh, leverage, leveraging open source so <laughs> um, and this I will explain as well. And at the end I would like to talk about a virtual cluster that I start um, developing on as a preparation of this talk and it kind of goes wild. So um, uh, this I would like to, to include as well. And in which bandwidth or in which portions um, that is uh, also depending on you. So if you have any questions, then don't be afraid and query me or yell at me or just ask a question, that's also possible. And um, as well, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm a little bit limited, let's say, or not limited, but I, I have this automotive, uh, automotive world view and this HPC view. And as I realized the other day, uh, there are others. You know, there, <laughs> there are web applications. And uh, so if you think that this uh, doesn't apply to your world, or you say that that exactly applies to your world, then don't uh, hesitate to, to throw this in and uh, start a quick chat about this because I'm very interested in other opinions. So, shall we start? Cluster stack, that's my working environment. So, my girlfriend said you should first discuss what a cluster is because uh, not everyone has the same cluster. For instance, what we uh, heard about or what we what we might hear or you might heard about is Elasticsearch and the Elasticsearch uh, cluster is a kind of 
you, you have one node and you talk to one node. If another node is joining, then you do not talk to two nodes. You, you, for you, it's transparent. So it's, uh, afterwards, it's, uh, it's one big Elasticsearch cluster for you. So the application or the end user do not care how many nodes he has. It's just uh, a sharding or a, uh, a high availability feature that the, the cluster is. For, for me, an HP, a cluster is an HPC cluster, so you have a, a big uh, or a lot of cabinets in a data center and a lot of nodes, oh, currently, let's say, 5,000 nodes in the current uh, data center next to my workplace. And this uh, cluster is working on one big problem, and it's uh, doing HPC. So HPC means high-performance computing, and uh, a good, um, in a nutshell, one could say it's surfing the bottleneck. So you try to saturate all resources you have in your cluster, and you try to um, saturate it as, as good as you could. Uh, if you do it quite well, then you would saturate the memory bandwidth, because this is the fastest bottleneck you, you might have, but uh, maybe you're limited by CPU, you're limited by I.O., or you're limited by uh, bandwidth of your interconnect. So, but you try to saturate your resources as much as you can. And the weakest link breaks your performance. So if you have a cluster job that's uh, running on 2,000 nodes and one node is not working well or is misbehaving, then uh, normally your application will suffer a lot and it will be uh, not performing anymore. And this is due to the usual workloads you might have. So the workloads are iterative uh, computation. So, for instance, this computation uh, does some uh, computation of fluid dynamics. So you have a, a mesh, if it's 3D or 2D, and you have time steps, and every time step is computed by a portion of, uh, of the nodes, and after each time step, they, they wait for the others, they sync, and then they will, uh, they, will return, or they will use the next iteration. So every iteration they sync, wait for the others, sync, wait for the others, and so on. And if some node is uh, slow, then 99% of your cluster is waiting for the one node to finish his work. So if one node is not responding, then you're screwed and uh, the job could be restarted. And uh, these applications might run for days, for weeks, on uh, a lot of nodes. And this is kind of expensive as well. That's why we try to solve this. So cluster layers. Um, I said rough estimate because I think that everyone has maybe a different opinion about cluster layers. And that's what I put together. And it's not uh, uh, something that you will look up into in, in, a, in a book. And it's exactly what I say here, so there might be some, some differences, but a rough estimate about layers, and each layer will present us events, like log events, or user events, or other events, and metrics um, that you can catch from an event as well. So maybe a web server will tell you uh, the response time, and this could be a metric for you. So on the bottom, we have the hardware. The hardware uh, gives you temperatures, gives you fans, uh, fan speeds, it will give you the hardware counters of, um, of components you have, you can touch, so like InfiniBand counters, you can query them directly. On top of that, uh, you somehow have the operating system with uh, kernel performance counters, kernel log events, and uh, user land tools you can uh, throw at your operating system and get events from that. Then I placed middleware like uh, MPI, which is a message passing, a message passing interface. So it's a, it's, a, it's a language or it's a, it's a way to um, communicate between processes if they are spread on a big cluster. Or l libraries that are from independent software vendors, so you have not much control of that. Then you sure have some services that you rely on. Your cluster has storage, it has uh, home storage, it has, might have a fast storage uh, that's uh, worked as, uh, for, for Scratch. So uh, your job will want to write an intermediate uh, data point and it doesn't want to write it in the home directory because it's slow, so he uses some fast Scratch storage for that. And you have uh, a job scheduler that will dispatch the job that you uh, requested the cluster to run. So 
Um, you might say, I want to run this script or this program on uh, 200 nodes, and then you will tell him, okay, this script, 200 nodes, go. And then you do not, uh, yeah, you do not interact much because then the job scheduler will do his work and schedule the job. So that's what the name stands for, right? And oh, and you have also no, sorry. Here we go. And you have also services that are simple but uh, necessary, like SSHD or uh, others. Without SSHD, you cannot initiate the job on the host because the communication is uh, maybe relied. Uh, the, the communication relies on such services. So the service you should not forget to start or to monitor or to event uh, to to log events on this. And then you have. Finally, the end user application, that is uh, the application that does this computation I showed you before, or other computations for sure, yeah. And with these five layers, roughly speaking, you, you could have different uh, angles on them. So there might be the end user who's only looking at his application and he wants to know when it fails, he wants to know rough uh, metrics about how long it's running and he wants to compare uh, maybe the, the run today and the run yesterday and he wants to know, okay, if it's, if it's fine, if it's 5% slower, then I don't care. If it's 5% faster, then I'm happy. But uh, he does not dig deep into all layers. And uh, that was true for, for customers that I support. So the customer says, you should not look too much into uh, all the problems that might occur. You just run the job, the test job that I provide you, and I give you a time frame that it should run. And if it's that time, uh, time frame and uh, the check of the result afterwards is the same, then stop. Yeah? I, pay, I do not pay you for looking for trouble. I pay you for uh, doing the job or keeping the job to be done. So it's a very limited view in some cases. Then you might have power users among the end users. So this is maybe the guy that's working on this, uh, on the, in this department for 20 years and he saw the first version of your application and he's, uh, he's very deep into most of the layers. Maybe it's not down to the very bottom, but uh, maybe a little bit farther, but he will have a view and this de depends on the specific uh, user, I guess, how, how deep he will go. So he looks further down into the layers and he knows, okay, the storage sh seems to be a little bit lacky. Uh, my gut says it's a middleware or m maybe you tweak the kernel and uh, I think that's not good. So he will have gut feelings that you should uh, take into account as well. And the ISV uh, is also one power user, so he invented the, the tool, so he might be a power user. And uh, there are a lot of sites where you have a dedicated developer or a, de a dedicated support guy sitting uh, on site, paid by, uh, by the ISV, and he's a power user if there is no other power user. So different views on this side. And then you have another layer that is Excel layer that I might call it. It's a management that doesn't care about much, but KPI, so key performance indicators, how much work uh, gets done currently and how much work should get done and are the server level, service level agreements are, are matched by the guys that are doing the support. So this layer is not really a real cluster layer but this is a, a real important layer because he's paying your, your hardware, he's paying for the service and uh, you should satisfy him in terms of this indicators and, and his view. So you should be able to take uh, his uh, walk some, some meters in his shoes and uh, try to be in line with his, uh, his values. And then we have the other way around. So the sysops guys or um, the support guys, the service guys, they are looking from the, from the bottom up the stack and depending on what uh, kind of service you have, what kind of level you are in, uh, when you start, maybe as a youngster, you, you service uh, level one, that means that you are in touch with the end user, he will call you, nothing works, and then you have to say, okay, I do not want to go deep into every layer, I just want to have a rough overview, maybe you have a chinga running, and then you can see, okay, everything is green, uh, there seems to be another problem that we are not covering, but he won't dig deep into every, uh, in every layer, he just 
try to fix the problem uh, that is at hand, and uh, there are mostly um, barriers that, that they should fix 90% of the problems that are coming in uh, in the first five minutes, like someone wants to have a user account, then he can create the user account. Someone wants to know, is everything okay? Then he, ca then he will uh, open a, a ticket, user asks, everything is okay? I said yes, close the ticket directly. So this, um, yeah, as I said, he won't dig too much in the, in the layer. And then we have uh, level two personnel, so where I place and how long I, I, I took the, this arrows is uh, no much need to, to pin it directly because uh, depending on every expectations, on every experience of the, of the administrator, he will place himself there. So level two might be only uh, the guys that are on the top of the layers and layer three maybe are deep into all layers or you have a, a department that is only responsible for one layer so you have all kinds of uh, permutations of these uh, layers uh, in general. And then you have the sits of management which are also includes the Excel layer on top and you also have the ISV management which are also try to satisfy the, the Excel layer. So there are a lot of um, layers here, I guess, and a lot of uh, angles to look at these layers. And uh, would you say that it applies to your environment as well, or do you have uh, less layers, or do you have more layers, or did I miss some layer, or do you think the placement of the layers is totally ridiculous, or some comments on that? Because, as I said, I would like to have some opinion. No? <laughs> yeah, but isn't the customer the end user? Or for me, I think the customer is the management guy. But he discusses with the customer sometimes. Right. The if they complain too much to the management, how then do you yeah. How do you think what 90% means really? 90% <laughs> of, uh, yeah. True. And uh, what's, we, what's not included here, and I'm not sure where to put it, um, a customer of a web service or if you have a website running, then it's not really an end user. The end user might be the developer of the application that you are serving. So maybe there's one additional layer somewhere, or maybe it's not a layer, it's completely somewhere else. Um, like the user of the of the service that is provided by the end user. Ah, but so, yeah. so it's a very shaky thing, and I think nailing it down, it, it, uh, it's uh, ridiculous because it's, it's floating a little bit. Okay, and layers. We have layers in every layer, and uh, so um, this slide is from Brent Gack, uh, who is a system Linux performance guy, or not Linux, so he's Unix performance guy. And uh, as you see, the operating system but these layers are, are interconnected, so you, there are, you, you have layers and layers, and they are connected in between, so the question is how deep to go, and it depends on, as well as the experience of the sysops or the devops or the, the guy that is digging into the layer. Yeah. Okay, and we have multiple data sources, as we saw, but we have, um, sometimes we have little data, sometimes we have uh, much data, but it's mostly garbage. So we have uh, multiple data sources and not, no way, maybe it's too harsh, uh, not often an obvious way to connect them. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, connecting is mostly manual labor. So uh, when I started and I had a, a problem, then I noted on my notepad, which was maybe pen and paper, but maybe it was an editor, I noted 2 p.m., 7 minutes, problem 1. And it was from layer you know, operating system. And then I got to the other layer and I said, okay, what happened in this layer to this time and then in the other layer? And when the, the page was full, then I throw it away and start again. Or maybe I, I detected an anomaly that I thought was connecting and digging and this was quite hard, let's say, and it's experience driven. So when you're a youngster or you're an administrator and you do not know much of every layer, then you fiddle around and you try to figure out what's the problem. And if you're lucky, you find it. But then it's very frustrating to see the guy that's working 10 years and he said, yeah, you know, we are now in version two, but in version zero, zero, one, 
I had the same issue. And I think they just failed and they introduced the bug again, so this might be this, and you should dig into this. And maybe he's not that verbose, he said, yeah, this is, this is clear, it's, you know, it's, it's obvious. Yeah. And then you say, okay, how, how did he know that? And uh, that's kind of sad. And uh, I said niche solutions are misleading. What I saw is that some vendors or some hardware vendors, they, they, they got sad that everyone is complaining and they decided, okay, you know, I will provide something for my layer and for the segment of the layer you, you are looking into. And they say, yeah, great, but you know, it's still, it's not fiddling in, in logs for this specific layer. It's, uh, looking into your tool, and then I, I note on my notepad, and then uh, we are continuing the, the the thing. So they think they do get they did good good to to provide such a tool, but without connecting connectiveness and openness and and uh, APIs to to drive this, not much to to do. So and Nagios, Singer, and stuff they are good tools to to get an overview, but digging deep into it hard. Okay, so um, the motivation of this is, uh, as I said, I, I was um, doing InfiniBand uh, two years or no, four years ago, 2010, I think I started. And uh, we had a big cluster. It was a flat one, but we had a lot of nodes, and it was a very <laughs> inconvenient uh, HPC cluster. But anyway, we had such switches. So this is one big box, and it looks like one switch, but in fact, you see here that uh, there are boards attached. So in fact, it's a chassis with a network in a box. So you have uh, here you have eight ports, and these eight ports are connected to switches that have four ports. That has four ports, and uh, they are uh, a tree in itself. So it, compo it is composed of a network. And um, for the obvious, of for the for the user that is only for the admin that is only used to Ethernet. He thinks, okay, that's a box, and uh, port one is uh, a port of a, of, a, of a switch, so what's the problem? But inside of this, you have routes taken by packages that might introduce the first fabric board from the green to the other green. They are maybe served by the second fabric board, or uh, there might be one fabric board for one direction and one fabric board for the other direction, and this is transparent to you. So if your job fails or your copy fails, uh, you do not know how the the route was, and this is um, only two fabric boards and four line boards, so it's uh, not real a real use case. But the debug nightmare was for me: we had a 96 port um, chassis that has eight line boards and four fabric boards, and three links in between every line and fabric board. So. And there was a job running that, uh, or multiple jobs running, that seemed to fail in c because there was a bad link in between the chassis. And we had, uh, as I said, 60, a 96 port switch. And um, on the switch, we had on the eight line boards, we had multiple islets of computation. So four nodes working together as a team, solving a problem. And these four nodes are not connected to only one switch or one line board, so one, one uh, leaf of the tree inside the chassis, they are connected widely throughout the switch. And what do you need? You need information about the job status, so if a job status fails, then you have to recognize, okay, there's a problem. Then you have to know which route were taken inside the chassis and wh what are the counters of the InfiniBand uh, ports, the internal ports, the external ports. So there are a lot of information that you have to, to scrap out of it. And the funny thing is, if you disconnect and reconnect a port, change the configuration, all routes are gone, they are recomputed, and you, you have no, no knowledge about the new routes anymore. So you cannot say, okay, it's clear, I, I unplug this and I plug it there, and if it doesn't work, then I can say, okay, these two nodes, they have something wrong, and then you plug something else, and then you can rely on the information you had previously, because the next iteration, everything might change, and then you screwed as well. So what I, <laughs> what I did was uh, I, I had ugly bash scripts for the counters, ugly bash scripts for the roots, and I tried to fiddle around with it, and I, I was pretty sure that it was fabric board one, 
But then the customer, the management guy with the Excel sheet, he came, you know, how long do it, did it take? Take it out, put another one in, and if it runs, then it's okay. And I said, oh, damn it, I would like to know which one, and I would like to know why. And he said, no, put it in, and then I swapped it, the error was gone, and I was left behind without knowledge, and that was sad. That was really sad. So I decided, okay, I would like to, to, to uh, dedicate my bachelor thesis to create an open source framework for InfiniBand net monitoring. And this was something that you, cannot, you, could, not, you could not buy, you, or you, can, you, you could buy this niche solution, this is misleading, that was provided by one vendor of InfiniBand, where you paid license fees and Splunk license fees, kind of, uh, not, not may maybe not that much, but it was uh, a couple of euros per node, and we had a lot of nodes, so it was kind of expensive, and it had an Excel export that was nice for the, for the management Excel part, but for the administrator it was useless because you could not connect the dots to other layers, so sadly. So I use um, OpenSM. OpenSM is uh, an open source subnet manager. Uh, the subnet manager is the service that provides routing information, so it computes routing information for the whole network. He assigns uh, kind of IP addresses for every node, and he's a guy, or he's a, he does a piece of software that's in charge of an uh, InfiniBand installation. And this um, OpenSM has a plugin, or a perform no, not a plugin, a performance manager that you can use to um, to trigger performance tokens. So it triggers every port in the, sub, uh, in the, in the fabric to send the, the metrics information. So it triggers every port and it receives the um, metrics for every port. And this is done in band, so InfiniBand does every management stuff in band and it uses a very high prioritized or the highest priority for communication. So this uh, information was very synced. So the problem with my bash script was I iterated over everything that is near the switch I want to monitor and then it starts at T0 and 10 seconds later I had every metric. But there was a delay between every metric. So you could not say this port sends to this port and this value should be the same as a corresponding receiving counter of the port because it was queried 10 seconds later and then the information was useless. So you have to have zinced information, and this was provided by this mechanism, which took only a couple of uh, milliseconds to, to sync, and then you're good. Yeah, and this triggers a callback within the performance manager where you can handle this uh, metric information. By default, there is a uh, plugin that uh, catches this callback, and it will write a file that uh, yeah, that can show you all the information. So you can write a big file and then you can try to analyze this file. So this is the first thing if you um, decide to, to, to use uh, InfiniBand, someday you will stumble upon this plugin and then you will say, okay, that would be nice. And then you change this plugin to write more information than you sh see here. It will write uh, the performance counter for every uh, port and then you can uh, run more interesting things to on this file. But I thought, okay, dumps into file. I thought, okay, this file stuff is nice, but I would like to have something else. And I invented this, or I changed the C code, and I'm not a C programmer, so please don't look at GitHub. Uh, I changed it to send the metrics to our tool and send events to Postgres. So um, our tool is interesting. But if you cope the first time, then you, you, you are very frustrated, I think. <laughs> but I managed to uh, get performance information of, let's say, 20 hosts or so. And then uh, I was screwed because this uh, RRD tool management, and I'm not a, not a big uh, RRD tool developer, so I maybe my, my uh, measurements were wrong in the first place. And my Postgres database also was not the best perf uh, may, maybe the best per, um, Postgres <laughs> database in the world. So that scales to 20 nodes and therefore was not uh, as practical as it could be for synthetic uh, studies to say, okay, we have a test network with 20 nodes and we want to see what, what happens. It was fine, but for production, not so. So um, since I'm now in R&D, I 
get uh, touched with Logstash and Graphite. So I decided to create the new version of the plugin, and I call it Kneep Next Generation. So I'm very creative. And this uh, sends metrics to Graphite and events to Logstash. And Logstash sends events to Graphite as well. So you can overlay information, and you can, you can see events. So an event in Graphite, and you, you have this, so you, maybe you, you attend to the Graphite talk, and maybe you got uh, touched with the Graphite virus. Uh, you have events in Graphite. I think it was not mentioned by, by the talk. You can send a curl or uh, just a, a post to, to Graphite, and it will create an event. And I created events for port down, port up, um, something restarts uh, within so, uh, OpenSM and stuff like that. And you can uh, overlay this information to your graphite graph. So here we see my very big four node cluster. And uh, you see the receive and send bytes for every node. And this black line or this red line is uh, the event of a port is down. And you see that. Uh, that the subnet manager node, so the node where the subnet manager lives, is the uh, one with the highest peak and the highest receive uh, part. He's getting events, and he, um, the other nodes are also uh, getting, getting a sync. Um, and at the end, you see the green bar, it's uh, that the port is coming up again, and then um, yeah, you see some spikes in the OpenSM node as well. And if you zoom in, then you can even see that the nodes uh, metric uh, stopped. So no, no counters were sent, and it goes flat. And this uh, scales to, so in InfiniBand, you have an InfiniBand simulator, which is kind of nice. So you, you create a, a theoretical topology file, which is very simple. And then you can start this InfiniBand simulator. You preload. Uh, little library, and then you can use all InfiniBand tools, so all the ugly bash script tools are used, uh, and, um, and, and query the InfiniBand network that is attached to your virtual um, network card. And you can run this OpenSM subnet manager on this virtual network as well, which is kind of a nice thing. So you can spawn a couple of hundred nodes if you have enough memory and CPU, and then you can run this, uh, this tool and yeah, you can play around with it. So this was InfiniBand. Any questions so far or any comments on InfiniBand? Who knows InfiniBand, by the way? Who uses it on a daily basis? Who hates InfiniBand? <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the thing is about InfiniBand that you approach InfiniBand and you think, okay, it's like Ethernet. And then you, you, since it's a very reliable thing, so you plug it in, it will work because the subnet manager runs on a switch and this switch can uh, serve as, I think they, they say, 700-something uh, nodes. So until then, you, and, and you have the simplest routing algorithm, which is uh, MinHop, so it just uh, compute routes, the minimal route between all the nodes. And then it runs fine. So the m smallest cluster I installed was four nodes, perfectly fine. Um, if you have 100 nodes, everything is fine. If you have problems with this cluster, then you might first dig into every other layer before you touch this layer because you think, OK, it's hard to debug because uh, you have only these errors that you can um, obtain with the command line interface. And as I said, it's pretty ugly. To, to handle, but normally it works fine, and every other layer is less reliable than InfiniBand. So normally you, you check, and maybe you have the, the most uh, common issues with InfiniBand are connector issues, so you might unplug the cable, plug it in again, and then you're happy because it works. So replug 90% of the problems, change the cable, 9% of the rest, although, though, so you have 99%, and the rest are errors you call someone. And uh, InfiniBand, uh, therefore, it's it's a nice uh, thing, but it's also, if it scales, or if you try to scale, it's hard. Anyway, so uh, I have an InfiniBand event and metrics, but that are not enough. It's one layer, and we have other layers. So I want to get real-world behavior. And that's not only for my own sake, partly, but also because I work at Bull and we um, create cluster management software. And creating cluster management software for clusters two years ahead is pretty uh, harsh because you have no clusters 
So I would like to have, and it's a, a wish that I have, that I had three, uh, three weeks ago, and I still have. I want to get real world examples of this cluster stack. So I want uh, Slurm, which is a resource scheduler that we uh, use, and it's open source, so I choose this. And I want compute nodes um, that are running real jobs, or real MPI jobs. And I want as much additional cluster stack as I can get. So I want Graphite, I want Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, Ichinga somehow, and I want all the other stuff. And I, I want this because I want to, to put in Ichinga, and then I want to put in Nagios, and then say, okay, no, I have to change back to Ichinga because the web interface is ugly. So I want to, to compare the different stacks, and I want to play around with it. So, and what I first did is, okay, virtual box with Vagrant is kind of nice to have and uh, nice, to, nice to use as well. And you can even orchestrate bigger clusters. So you can have a Vagrant file. Every, who knows Vagrant? Okay, perfect. So you can have a Vagrant file which has a for loop and then you can start 20, 20, 20 nodes or 10 nodes, depending on your system. But for every node, you, you resource or you, you pin resources to the node. So you say, okay, you have a, you, you guy, you, you have a one uh, CPU, you cap at 50%. And the other one has the other CPU. And in my environment, I have uh, fairly big machines with 32 cores so, and 500 gigabytes of RAM, so I can spawn some. But um, if I have this cluster and I have jobs that are using one third of the cluster for one given time, and then five minutes later, I spawn a job that uses the other third, and then I spawn a job that runs the other third, then the resources are limited to this capped CPU and capped RAM that I dedicated to the node. So I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, run a high, well, uh, high workload on, on one third of the cluster because uh, they are limited in the box. And all the resources, are, so the guest OS and stuff, they are, they, are, they are the same in every node. And if I spawn, so I want to spawn, and hopefully I will someday, 500 nodes, let's say, then I have 500 times the same uh, operating system and yeah, I think that doesn't get far. So I uh, went out to the internet and I found Docker. And that was something that was one on, on my list anyway. And I was looking for a use case to use Docker. And this was a perfect match. So uh, in Docker, we, uh, we have this um, virtualization, which shares the, the same kernel as uh, the host system and which does uh, funny things like uh, you, you, if you deploy an image and uh, the image is used by different containers, then uh, you, you save a lot of resources. So, uh, and it's, it's basically, it's, and I have, not, I have this three uh, weeks experience, so uh, if you're there, maybe I I'm get it wrong, but uh, for me it's like change root on steroids because uh, you spawn a bash and it's encapsulated, so you, you type uh, PS minus EF, and you only see your bash, the PS, and the grab that I autocomplete PS. So if I type PS minus EF, this took me three days. I type PS minus EF, and then automatically I, I type grab, and then I thought, okay, well, what, what, are I, what am I grabbing for? And then I deleted it, I pressed enter, and I had two processes. And then I thought, okay, you have to get rid of this pipe grab because it doesn't get you something somewhere. So you have only this couple of processes. And you have your dedicated network device, and with Graphite you can just uh, collect metrics for this dedicated network device. And you have a very, as you have very limited um, processes, you get very cool, clean metrics for these processes. So if you S copy within, then you do not have metrics uh, on other processes that uh, that send metrics that you that you that you do not in initiate initially thought of. And another thing that I didn't use now, but I will is C groups. C groups, pretty nice. You can uh, pin a process and say, OK, you are only allowed to use one kilobit per second on the block device. You are only allowed to use 50 kilobit per second on the network device. Or you are only allowed to use such and such uh, CPU performance. So with this, I should be able to create a cluster with 500 nodes where every a uh, cluster node is only capable of running one thousandth of uh, CPU core's performance. And then I can use normal, let's say, applications, so MPI applications that are normally running on a cluster, 
and I can tell, okay, you are normally you are a very big guy and you, uh, you, you, you measure the performance of a supercomputer, so Linpack for instance, and uh, I can limit the, the node's uh, capacity or the node's resources that he's allowed to consume and then I can run untouched uh, code on this uh, machine and it will give me cool performance metrics. And it's highly automatable as well, so this is some uh, nice, and it's a nice tool. So, and now for the guys uh, watching, I will make a break and you can watch uh, the talk from Tobias. A couple of hours ago was recorded, so you can do that. And uh, then you'd click play again. And uh, so we have this host, this uh, virtual, this host where all my clusters, uh, cluster nodes are living on. And I have uh, one master node which uses etcd uh, as an inventory kind of. And it should provide a DNS service and it should provide a slurm control daemon, which is the master of this job scheduler. I have a monitoring uh, container which uh, has graphite and statsd installed. So statsd I'm not using yet, but uh, still. And I have log management, which is Elasticsearch and Logstash Kibana, so EL, uh, ELK. Okay. And um, I have compute nodes and the compute nodes running uh, Slurm client, so they connect to the master and say, okay, here I am, give me a job. And uh, they, I would like, as I said, I would like the end to be at least 500 to um, have a, a huge cluster. Maybe I can get more, but let's say I run, so far I run uh, 160 or so. Uh, and I, but I, I think I will tell, or I will talk about it later. Um, and I would like to have alarming, uh, Echinga or Agios or Shinken or maybe all of them to compare them, but it's not integrated yet. So the master node, and this is how, how Docker is used, and uh, as you saw the talk of uh, Tobias, I think you will recognize. Um, you tell uh, image to run in a container and you tell them uh, that you would like to, to run a bash inside of it. So here we go, and it runs uh, etcd, which is a key value, a high, availab high available uh, ET, uh, key value store, um, which is very, very nice. And it provides a DNS. So if a uh, compute node comes up, he sends, okay, I'm compute node zero and I have this IP address. This information is um, encapsulated into the DNS server and uh, you can then SSH into the compute node. And for SSH, you need the reverse lookup, so this is also um, also done. Um, yeah, and this is my automation so far, but I think I should uh, integrate Radar, Ansible, or whatever fits this need to have an uh, upcoming host that I didn't saw before and configure the SlurmD and Inchinga and all the services I have appropriately. So all the non-master hosts, they are started with the master as a DNS server, so they will look into their ETC resolve and they will know what the master is. They will query the DNS server of the master. That's the purpose of a DNS server. They will mount uh, various files or various uh, um, directories from the host. So Scratch, for instance. So this is a file system that where you can uh, use you can use as a temp, let's say. Uh, and they will. Uh, we, I have a C home, which is a cluster home. And this hopefully sits on SSDs. So in my case, it does. And uh, then Supervisor D kicks in. Uh, who knows Supervisor D? Oh, you should, you should look it up. That's pretty nice. It's like a system D in, uh, in Python. And it's pretty, um, pretty easy to set up and pretty easy to use. And since, uh, Docker, has you, you, since Docker, if you, if you are in the same kernel as the host, so if you need something from the host kernel to, to uh, load a module or something, you are not allowed. So this is why system D kinds of uh, not work. Maybe now they, they work, but I didn't get it uh, up and running. So, and Supervisor D is kind of the common sense. Uh, if you look at Docker files uh, in other, uh, in other, um, other projects, then you will see that they all use system, uh, Supervisor D. And then it starts sending metrics to Graphite, logs to Logstash, and um, yeah, that's, um, that's how, it's how every non-master node works. So the Docker compute node, he uh, sets up and it's not, not very visible. So this is, if, if you do not uh, provide a command 
that the uh, compute node should start with. It will start with the command that you provided in your build process of this image. So I provide supervisor D as a, as a normal um, start command. And this is the output of supervisor D. So he spawns a setup uh, script that just sends the IP and the host name to etcd. It then starts the SSHD server. It starts diamond, which is a metric collector, which is also nice. So if you do not know uh, how to gather metrics on a system, you should use diamond. Uh, it starts munch, which is a server to uh, authenticate Slurm. And it starts Slurmd, which is, as I said, the client for the uh, job scheduler. And it starts logs-forwarder, aka lumberjack, which just uh, write, uh, reads in files and send it to logstash. So, and it starts. Op uh, it, it has uh, libraries for OpenMPI, and it has uh, QPerf, which is uh, a tool that uh, can run TCP uh, latency and benchmarks uh, on the bandwidth, and not only TCP, also uh, InfiniBand benchmarks. And I start this to be able to to uh, to to connect a client to every node and just run some benchmarks. So this, this is nice as well. Then I have the Docker Graphite node um, that is a f has a full, com full graphite stack with StatsD. It stresses the I.O., which is kind of, uh, of, uh, of weird, but I love SSDs. And I had two for now, and uh, they are saturated to 30%, even with a couple of nodes, so it's kind of weird. I need to take uh, much more care about this. Um, but as far as I, I, I get it, it worked. And I have this ELK, it's uh, Elasticsearch Logstash Kibana uh, bundle that is just a node with uh, this Logstash forwarder input. So he receives this, the, the logs from the nodes. I have no filter applied, so if you, you know uh, Logstash, uh, you normally you, you will pass what you get and you will do things with it. So I didn't do this now, but I will. And everything is put into Elasticsearch, and then you can use Kibana for the stuff to look at. And now it's alive. I had a little bash uh, function in my bash LC where I can just start a, a node. Um, I will just spawn the container and then I send an event. If it's successful, I send an event to Graphite that the container has started. And if it's not, if, then I will send an event that it failed. And if I do this over a couple of nodes, then I will get this dashboard view. So I have this horizontal lines are the container start events. And uh, in the background, we see that uh, the IO weight user and system of my host system. Yeah. So you see that if I start a container, he has to do something. That's, that's normal, I guess. And this is on a three core AMD at my mother's place. So yeah, it's uh, not very fast, but uh, it's OK. And if I start a, s a Slurm host uh, client, a domain, a, a compute client, then um, I see this compute clients uh, within Slurm. So I can see, OK, I have the first nodes I started earlier. So they are in idle, they're waiting. And the other nodes are down because Slurm thinks, OK, if, you, if, you, you, if, if nodes are coming back to the configuration, you should look at them. And then you should say, uh, I, I have this highlighted. You should say, update the node status to idle. And then they are available for running jobs. And running jobs in Slurm is pretty easy, or in every job scheduler. Uh, you, you have commands to run um, commands or to run uh, things interactively. So uh, with s run minus n 16, I, I say, okay, I would like to run a command on every six on 16 nodes, and this command is host name, and uh, then the output will be brought back to to the submission host. And this, you see, it's not ordered because the responses of the different nodes are coming back in a wild order. So. I got the response, and this tells me that everything worked fine. And to this, for this to run, you have to SSH part what less than every host. So yeah. And um, I had a little MPI job. So um, the job is to do a matrix multiplication. So you have two. So I do not. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this mathematics stuff. But you have two matrices that you want to multiply, and there is a formula to do this, and you can spread the word or the work pretty, pretty nicely. So this um, creates, or this job is just simply uh, multiplying the matrices and iterating through all the steps. And if you um, do this without 
um, slowing down the computation, then it will saturate the host pretty pretty much. So what I did, I, with the help of colleagues, I um, I did a delay or a sleep within every iteration. So the the nodes are computing the metrics. Uh, the, the matrices uh, as they normally do, but I sleep every iteration for 200 milliseconds. So uh, by default, it's 500 milliseconds. So they sleep, then they do the next. So by this, by doing this, uh, the application is not using much CPU, and I, I uh, even if they do not much computation, I get all the communication for the. Or the communications patterns are still the same; they are just scaled down. So normally they will saturate the network, but with the sleeping they only do a couple of kilobytes per per second. But I do not care about the scale of the performance metrics. And we will see a picture. I just care about patterns. So that's pretty nice. And when the job starts, I send an event. When the job ends, I send an event as well. So and by uh, submitting this, so as batch is a command to send a job to the queue. And I said, okay, 16 hosts should uh, use this script, and they should run uh, matrices that have uh, 65k size. This job is submitted to the queue, and here you see it's in status run, and it's running for three seconds now, and it's doing their magic work. And then when I turn to graphite, uh, to the graphite web interface, then I can see that here the job is starting. He's uh, doing some heavy lifting. It's as well the three-core host, so he's not very powerful. And then the communication starts to flow. Um, the first job is doing uh, 250 milliseconds every iteration, and the next job is doing 500 milliseconds every iteration. And you see that even the communication patterns within the matrix multiplication uh, you can see that there is some iteration groups that I do not r understand completely, but my colleague said it was his PhD work that he provided. He said, yeah, that, that's, that's as I thought it would look like. So that's kind of nice, and you can, uh, with this, if you just inject sleeps, then you can see how the pattern works without uh, having a big cluster. And I do not care about the result, I, do not, I only care about the, um, the, the patterns. And since I start this QPerf, I can al also do uh, a, a TCP bandwidth benchmark um, on every node. So I start on compute zero and spawn a two-minute TCP benchmark to every other node. So this, ha uh, this line here is uh, the sending of the first node, and these lines here are the receiving. Uh, are this is the receiving of the um, of the servers. And as you see, my little host is uh, pretty busy with this. So it's not only for the synthetic uh, MPI benchmarks I run, it could be also be used for other stuff. So um, future work, so this maybe is over-accurated the, the picture, but what I would like to do in the next couple of days, weeks, months, whatever it takes, uh, I would like to provide an Echinga or Nagios or both um, image. Uh, where I can see the states of the different layers, uh, because this um, is kind of state of the art, what is used in every cluster. So um, I will like to bundle this with uh, Kibana and with Graphite as well, and I think it's not a not a big deal. So, question is for me: uh, Will it scale? So now we are at 5,000 nodes, and this is pretty ugly. Uh, if we have 50,000 nodes in two years. Who is clicking on graphite? Uh, who's clicking on, on uh, Nagios and who's clicking on Echinga? And I think this will be a very, very tough, uh, tough thing. On this uh, cluster, I, I was supervising uh, at Daimler. We had 4,000 nodes and we had, uh, we had Nagios with uh, this very ugly uh, web interface. But at least we, we got some information. And with what we, what we, all, what we really need was this um, parent uh, uh, relationship. So we have a, we had an in-house um, monitoring solution that has no parents, and so if one switch goes down, then everything was <laughs> was red, and you did not know where the root cause was. So okay, that was an improvement that was very good, but uh, with 5,000 or 4,000 nodes, and we are talking only on about nodes, we're not talking about all the infrastructure in between. So we might have 7,000 nodes, and every rate of every uh, file server is also 
um, as al it was also an item in, in Nagio. So if something went wrong, then we will have everything red again and you cannot manage this. And I think this is a very serious threat, let's say, to, to big clusters or to big installations. So I don't, don't know how to, how to figure out how to deal with it, but maybe we will, hopefully we will. And what I also would like to have is a cluster file system. So uh, in a cluster, you, you, you want to store snapshots. So if a, a node dies, then your application is dead. So you, if a job is running for two days, then you might want to be able to restart from, not from the beginning, but from intermediate steps. And to do this, you have to dump the whole memory of every node, and this is called checkpointing. So by if you do this, and every node has, uh, ov every core uh, rough estimate is uh, three to four gigabytes, everyone, <laughs> yeah, four minutes, okay, five, but uh, there's no other speaker, so. You can flee, maybe. <laughs> anyway, um, so you have four gigabytes per core, and you have 32 cores, so you have a lot of memory to dump, and you want to have a fast um, scratch for this. And that's where Luster and GPFS and all how, how you call them, uh, all these cluster file systems came in. And they are very central um, infrastructure element in the cluster. So you want to be sure that this is uh, dealt with, and so I would like to introduce this into my cluster as well. But since all of them are using uh, kernel modules, it's kind of uh, not obvious how to use it with Docker. I think if I compile the host kernel with the modules, then I should be fine, but I didn't. So um, this might be pushed somewhere else. And I'm close to the finish, so it would be, but yeah. If you have questions and you, you like to ask, so throw at me, right? Uh, as I said, and I think an another threat, or not a threat, <laughs> something to deal with is humans, so if we introduce stuff like Lost Logstash, if we introduce stuff like Graphite, if we introduce something else, which is uh, this fancy new stuff that we have, uh, 50-year-old sysadmin working at a cluster and uh, mastering grab AVK and stuff, he will be very frightened that he will be replaced, that his, all his knowledge will be for, for worthless. And so I think we have to figure out how to interact with these uh, administrators and to introduce ways for new guys, for, or for, for medium, medium for, for guys that are working for five years there, and guys that are working for a long time and that are maybe ha has a fear and maybe a real fear to be replaced because they do not understand this new click way to to handle the cluster. I think this had to be um, to be dealt with in some way. So um, that's a concern that we have. And we have a truckload of events. We have a truckload of metrics. We have a truckload of interactions. And the question is, how do we store everything? Uh, there, there are ways to store them, but you have to decide uh, beforehand how to store it. And after two uh, weeks, years, or decades, you might say, ah, man, I should have stored it another way. And uh, then you're screwed. For instance, we have a job running on four nodes, and we want to know the metric uh, usage of the memory. Then we can do uh, this this query in, in, logs, uh, in, in Graphite, where we just say, okay, node 1, 30, 35, and 95. Um, but if you have 1,000 nodes and you have to create this query, then it's kind of lame. So you might say, okay, I organize it in a different way. So every job has, uh, or there's a prefix for every job, and if a job starts, then you forward all the metrics to a different destination, and therefore you, you have easier queries to, to, to throw at, uh, at Graphite and to cope with uh, the load. But um, I don't know how to, how to deal with it yet. I think we will go there somehow. And um, another thing I would like to do is create a real network. So now I have, uh, I have this Docker zero bridge on the host system, and every uh, container is connected to this bridge, so it's a flat network, it's kind of lame. Um, I would like to have virtual switches where everyone is connected so that you can create bottlenecks between switches and that you can mock up real clusters or be, be closer to the real world. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, this is how you create Docker images. You create Docker files and you kind of have a really good how-to 
um, that describes how the image was created. And I put this on GitHub, and I create an index or repository on Docker I.O. And I will add all the other nodes that I use in my cluster. And uh, the best case, you just use Fedora 20, for instance, or Ubuntu, install Docker, and say Docker run kneep slash graphite. And then it will download the image, and it will run the Docker graphite uh, image on your, on your system. And the same with uh, compute nodes, and you can spawn your own cluster without much hassle. That's the theory. We will see how this works out in, in practice. But I, um, I have a, a link here for my private blog. It has only <laughs> one default entry, but I would like to put this into uh, a blog entry, and then you should be able to easily create this, this cluster that I just presented. Yeah, that's about it. And I'm in time, but uh, not in time. I, I should have 10 minutes to ask. Uh, to, to ask questions. So if you have questions, I'm here. I leave tomorrow. So you can ask me now. You can ask me later. Whatever fits your needs. Thanks. OK, thank you, Christian.